Hello, welcome to TFIR and this is your host Swapnil Bharatiya and today we are going to talk to Jacques Nadu, CTO and co-founder of Dreamio, a company that specializes in fully open source data analytics software. The most interesting thing about this company is that almost 90% of their software is fully open source and they are heavily involved with three major Apache software foundation projects. In fact, uh, the, the, the product from Dreamio is based on these three products. So without further ado, let's go and talk to Jacques. Jacques, before we kind of deep dive into this interview, can you quickly introduce yourself? Yes, of course. So my name is Jacques Nadeau. I am a CTO and co-founder at Dremio. Um, I'm also active in several open source projects. Uh, uh, part of the initial team that started the Apache Aero project. I'm involved in Apache Calcite, uh, contribute to Apache um, Parquet sometimes. Um, and so just to give a little background on what Dremio is, Dremio is a open source uh, self-service data platform uh, designed to make data consumers have an easier time of accessing data. Um, and also try to reduce the load on data engineers um, and make some of the tasks that they do today um, easier so that uh, end users can do those things directly. Uh, when you say self-service data platform, can you just kind of, you know, what exactly is that? Yeah, so it, very simply, um, uh, we try to make data available to end users um, without having to make them worry so much about the mechanics, the sort of physical or mechanical side of data. And what I mean by that is, is that um, data may be in many systems. If I'm an analyst, I'm not that interested in what particular type of technology the data is in. I just want to interact with that data, um, do data science activities against it, do machine learning, uh, do analysis against it. Um, and so what we try to do is create um, what we sometimes call a Google Docs for your data, a place where you okay. can find all the different data sets that are available to you, um, that you can collaborate with other people around those data sets, and that uh, you can connect those up to what other tools you like to use to analyze. Oh, that's that's interesting because the collaboration part is kind of interesting. Where uh, uh, so it's, it's like uh, but since it's like Google Docs, it, it has a web interface where people can log in and then do that. That that's exactly right. So the right. the primary interface for the product is is a web UI, um, which allows um, which shows all the data that might be available to you, um, indexes that, um, and allows you to manipulate that data, curate it, um, uh, create what we call virtual data sets, which are derived versions of data. Um, and allows basically business users to work in a logical world where they're not that concerned about um, where data might be stored or what underlying system it might be, whether it's a relational system, a big data system, a NoSQL system. Okay, uh, and so it's, uh, it, as you said, you know, it really doesn't matter, but where do you run yourself on AWS? What kind of cloud infrastructure do you use to, to host the data? Yeah, so, so today Dremio is a piece of software um, mm -hmm. uh, that is used both on-premise and in the cloud, um, so okay. probably about half and half of our half, our, half of our uh, users and customers are on premise, running in their data centers, half in the cloud, um, mm -hmm. and it can run on uh, a it's a distributed system um, that can run in a um, environment. For example, let's say you're running Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and Oracle, um, you would run Dremio on um, a set of nodes. It could be uh, maybe secondary secondary read nodes for some of your other systems, or it could be a separate cluster, um, and then Dremio does uh, work to try to make that data available to end users. Um, it could also be in something like a, um, a Hadoop environment, in a, in a data lake environment like Hadoop. Uh, um, we can okay. interact directly with something like Yarn um, to deploy um, and use that as sort of containerization methodology. So if you have a containerized deployment, uh, distributed deployment strategy, um, then we can use that. But if not, you can just put us on bare metal. Okay, so it's like totally multi-cloud, uh, multi you know, uh, users can choose where they want to run it. There's no yeah, uh, exactly. log. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the perspective is is that uh, everybody's sort of environment. There's so many complex technologies out there that everybody's environment is 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 quite right. different. And so, trying to be um, as open to different ways of working as possible. Right. And uh, who are your like typical customers who are consuming this uh, service and technology? Well, it's a range. So. Um, we uh, we do sell uh, a lot to large enterprise, so um, we have several um, public customers um, in the Fortune uh, 500, um, as well as uh, many more that uh, we're working on making sure that we get them public um, and so that people can hear about them. But um, so we do a lot of work there. Um, but because we have an open source product that's a, a community edition that people can download and play with or fork to GitHub or whatever, 
Um, we also see a lot of um, uh, smaller businesses and startups who um, adopt our technology. So the reality is, is that um, the complexities and the governance requirements of large enterprises um, are obviously different than smaller companies, um, but all of them are suffering from the same problem, which is, is that it's too hard to get the data. People are uh, having difficulty finding the, the number uh, of data engineers that they need given how they're working with data today. Um, and so they need some technology to help them out. Right, right. Now, now let's just kind of quickly switch gears and talk about the open source angle here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, how much of your products are like open source? So um, we're about 95% open source. We have an open core model. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the software is on GitHub and is Apache license. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we believe that that's critical for all size organizations in order for them to um, these, these data technologies, they get heavily integrated into other parts of, the, of, of a company's sort of uh, technology ecosystem. And so being able to um, understand how the code is working, uh, extend the code, um, uh, you know, enhance it for the certain requirements that you have is something that's very important to us. Um, and so uh, that's the Dremio product. Now on top of that, uh, on, uh, below that, um, we have a, a strategy where we're uh, focused on really collaborating and building um, communities around some of the core components um, that we build our technology on. So we can't be, do what we do without um, working with uh, a number of really important open source technologies. Um, the three that we are most actively engaged with and uh, leverage and, uh, and uh, also um, uh, enjoy the benefits of um, are um, Apache Arrow, Apache Calcite, and Apache Parquet. Um, and so, um, I don't know how familiar uh, you and uh, the, your viewers are to each of those technologies. So if you want, I can kind of give a quick overview of each of those. Does that make sense? Yes, off, that, that'd be perfect. Yeah. yeah. So um, so let's start with Apache Parquet. So Apache Parquet is the, uh, I believe, uh, I think Calcite and Parquet are about the same age. But um, Parquet is uh, what I would call the de facto um, standard commoner on disk format for data. Okay. It was originally inspired out of the Dremel paper from Google. Um, and has been adopted by pretty much every big data technology there is. Um, and so um, it orients the data on disk um, in a columnar format, um, and that benefits um, analytical operations because you might have an analytical table that has hundreds of columns, but each time you're looking for data, you may only be looking for a few of those columns. And so by orienting the data on disk, you can get to the data that you want faster without reading as much data. Um, and so that's sort of the core. And so anytime we're writing stuff to disk, we're generally writing it in, in a Parquet format. Um, we are optimized to read uh, Parquet very, very quickly. Now, the second um, project that was, uh, I mentioned was Apache Calcite. Um, Apache Calcite um, actually has come, uh, there's been a development on the code that is now Apache Calcite for almost 15 years, I think now. Um, and it, at its core is a um, uh, pieces of a database. Um, it's not trying to be a database itself, um, but it has several different pieces. One of the core pieces is a uh, volcano-inspired query optimizer, um, which is a cost-based, uh, uh, highly powerful um, optimizer framework with a bunch of pre-built sort of optimizations to um, sort of figure out what can be faster. Um, um, and is used by, I think, probably 15 or 20 different big data technologies now as a way to understand SQL and optimize queries. Um, so we use that extensively to do up a lot of our work. And then the third project um, is the newest of the three. Um, it's called Apache Arrow. Um, Apache Arrow was something that uh, we actually um, were part of the team that started the project about a year and a half ago now, maybe two years ago now. Not sure exactly when, a little while ago now. <laughs> um, but what we saw was, was a need for, so if you look at most organizations, they have um, a large number of different data technologies that can help them. Um, but what happens is, is that when you're trying to work on a particular data use case, um, you kind of get stuck in one system. And the reason you get stuck in one system is because it's very expensive to move data between different systems. Okay, right. so that was one dynamic we identified. Um, and so it's kind of like, that's why monolithic systems are kind of work well, is because you know that you can move from one operation in a monolithic system to another, and you don't have to pay a lot of overhead. Whereas mm -hmm. if I want to say, you know, do a pipeline which starts in Kafka, then moves to Spark, then moves to Python, then moves into a BI, back to Spark, then into a BI tool. Um, there's a lot of sort of overhead moving the data between each of those different sort of parts of the system, different systems. So that was the first sort of trend we identified as a problem. The second one was is that um, while everything is columnar on disk, 
people were generally, once they brought data into memory, they were working on it row-wise. And um, traditional databases always used to do row-wise operations. It was the, kind of the first way to do things, the easy way to think about things. Excuse me. Um, but it's not the most optimal. So CPUs are, are, are very efficient on working on doing similar operations, having data lined up right so that you can pay attention to cache locality, um, being able to operate on multiple values simultaneously with the instructions and those kinds of things. Um, and row-wise, this doesn't work very well with the way that modern CPUs work. Um, and that's not just true for CPUs, but also GPUs. So GPUs are also very good at vectorized operations um, uh, and, uh, and sort of holding data in memory in a, in a useful format to process very quickly. And so we saw the two different po pain points there, and we said there needs to be a new project. Um, uh, there needs to be a new way of trying to solve this problem. And so ERA was born out of that. And so before the project even got started, there was maybe uh, three or four of us. Uh, Wes McKinney was one of the ones that was involved very early on. Marcel Kornacker was involved very early on. Todd Lipcon uh, from Cloud Era, who works on Kudu, was involved very early on. We started having discussions about how do we collaborate as uh, a group of different technologies to try to solve these sort of fundamental problems. Um, and so had several discussions, ultimately decided, hey, you know what, there's a good opportunity here to build a new, to start a new Apache project. And so we brought uh, people from all sorts of different uh, big data and open source projects together started up this new project, and really its goals are to solve those two things I just talked about, which is one is, how do we have a canonical way of holding data in memory so that it's very mm -hmm. efficient to move between one context and another? Um, and then the second thing is, uh, how do we uh, make sure that that's a representation which is very high speed uh, in terms of how fast you can process it and how well it leverages modern uh, CPUs and GPUs? Um, and so the representation was designed for that in mind, and so the project is really about those two things. It's about um, being able to move data in memory very quickly between different contexts, um, and then being able and that having that representation also be very efficient um, for processing purposes. So that's the third sort of big open source project that we um, are heavily involved in and and and, and, and try to um, um, help make successful. It's a group of a lot of different people who are contributing to it. We're just one of those, but um, we care deeply about those projects. And so um, and so Dremio as an open source technology. Um, is also built on top of these three sort of foundational components uh, in terms of open source. And so um, I've been active in Apache for uh, many years now um, and uh, uh, appreciate the consensus we can build there um, and also like the attractiveness of the license um, to be friendly to, um, to, uh, to build a company um, that can support open source but also figure out how to, uh, to monetize that. Right, and it, and all these three projects are part of Apache Software Foundation, right? That's right. The, right. the three but foundational products yeah. are part of the Apache yeah. Fo Foundation project. Yeah. Our mm -hmm. product is Apache license, oh, uh, but it's actually something but, that we yeah, run ourselves. Right. Okay. So, but yeah. uh, from what I am aware, that Apache has a very stringent, you know, policies to to get the packet. They have like incubation stages, and they have attic, and they have all those things. So, so what is what is it in incubation, or is fully? Uh, what is the stage these three projects are at? Yeah, so these are all top-level projects. Um, top-level, okay. Uh, so um, the Parquet and Calcite projects both went through incubation several years ago um, mm -hmm. and became top-levels, I think, three or four years ago probably for both of those. Um, the um, Aero project was a little bit unique in that um, uh, because of the nature of the people who were coming together um, and what was already figured out, um, mm -hmm. it actually skipped the incubation stage and went straight to a top-level project. But that uh, primarily, so... Incubation is about making sure that the community is going to be able to right. sustain itself, yes, and also yes. making sure that the that the developers involved um, understand sort of the Apache, um, Apache, what we call the Apache way, which is basically yes. a way of approaching uh, consensus building and sort of collaborative development. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's other open source models, but Apache is very much about consensus. And so um, right. the incubation is about making sure that those things are understood and, and, and are part of the community. And so um, with Arrow, I think the people were involved. I think. There were uh, maybe 15 or 20 people who were already Apache committers in other mm -hmm. projects, um, and maybe five or 10 of those were already Apache members, which means that they've been with Apache for a very long time and, and have a, a special set of roles there. Um, and so it made sense to just go to a top of a project for that one. Yeah, because I, I have monitored you know, Apache closely, and I have been doing open source for like 13 years. So because they have, the, what I like about Apache Software Foundation is that when they do take a project, their, their, their policy is so that they ensure that the product will be sustainable. It's not like developers will just suddenly disappear tomorrow. 
So that's yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's so yeah, it's and that is why it's, it's really it's really really important. And I think that the incubator yes. does a good job of that, right? Because right, you know, right. while many incubated projects actually turn into a top level Apache project, um, there mm -hmm. are some that do not because mm -hmm. um, it turns out that the uh, people that are involved don't have enough time, or mm -hmm. um, the project is really driven by only a single organization, isn't really sort of open, and realize that they're not as open to consensus building as, as, as maybe they need to be. Um, and so there's many reasons that that doesn't happen, but it's a good way of sort of getting people uh, to be able to wait around in the Apache space before they sort of dive, you know, head first. Yeah, because one of the concerns in open source projects remains, you know, that I, I interviewed Brian Ballendorf of few weeks ago, uh, and the one question was how to ensure that the project is sustainable because just because it's open source doesn't mean it can still die off, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, Apache does a very good job there. Uh, in addition yeah, to that, since you are, you are yeah, you're heavily involved with open source uh, and uh, the company itself is contributing a lot, you know, and open sourcing your product. I remember like uh, when I started my own uh, journalism career, which was like 13 or 14 years ago, I completed my course and I, and I the first job uh, I got was with Linux for you magazine. So I had like for the day one, I have been an open source journalist. Uh, back in those days, one of the challenge was that uh, we had to go out and educate companies that why you should use open source. What are the benefits? But now uh, almost everybody is using open source. The question is who is not using and why not? So the new challenge that we see is that uh, these new users of open source don't actually understand how the open source process actually works. That why you should send your developers to 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 events or why they should you know continue contribute in their office time. So, so uh, since you have been involved with for so long and you deal with a lot of customers and clients, do you see this pattern there where companies don't understand? Yeah, I, th I think, I, th I think so. I mean, I think, uh, let me say that, I mean, I think at the start, you're absolutely right, which is, is that um, one of the good things that's happened with open source is that most enterprises now have an open source, open source first strategy. And so anytime mm -hmm. they're doing a technical evaluation, they, they need to also look at what options available open source. And so that level of corporate sort of, uh, sort of top down sort of, hey, this is an important part of business strategy and should be considered, I think is very good. Um, I think that um, uh, businesses are very good at taking care of themselves, right? And, and so, I mean, that's kind of the nature of, of a commercial entity at some level. Um, and so I think that people are very much like they appreciate all of the benefits of open source, right? Because open source allows you to sort of, um, uh, you know, protect yourself, uh, yourself against the uh, uh, lock-in, the ability to extend the product um, if you need to, um, the ability to, um, you know, just solve a problem if you can't get someone else to solve it for you because it's super important to your business. Um, and so I think that a lot of people um, appreciate that uh, part of open source when they're looking at it from a commercial um, organization perspective. Um, I think that people don't really understand how it works. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, is, and, and I think there's two parts to that, right? First of all, realistically, if you look at most, of, well, I don't know if it's most, a large number of Apache projects um, that have been started in the last five years or so um, are um, developed probably um, maybe 70, 80% of the development time that goes into those projects is by one or more companies that are directly benefiting from um, the success of those open source technologies, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's a form of sort of um, paid open uh, pay, paid open source or, or or sponsored open source, right? Um, and so um, the idea that all open source is done by people who you know in their free time in the garage, it's not true for a lot of these projects, mm, the no. super successful projects that are getting a lot of options. Not to say that it, it does exist. There's definitely cases where it, it, it's been very successful, um, and so um, and so. My, my perspective on it is is that uh, that if you think that in that co in that context, it's not going to be realistic that every organization is going to be able to invest um, developer time directly against um, uh, adding new features to open source projects. But I actually think that the 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 lower the the sort of easier win for most organizations um, is is that they can contribute to the quality of open source projects. Right. So um, making sure that you are reporting back things that you see and collaborating to fix them and probably helping out to fix them sometimes um, is I think what would be the goal I would first say is should be a goal for most enterprises using open source software is is that um, if you're benefiting a lot from this, um, find the time to um, help with quality. I think that realistically most organizations unless they have a really important feature that they need are not going to be able to contribute the amount of time that it takes to build something um, from scratch. 
um, but they can definitely improve the product. Um, and that is true both providing bug reports, but also um, where possible trying to allow people a little bit of time to help um, fix things. And so it's actually a funny situation that just happened very recently. Is we had a customer who found an issue with our product um, and then it turned out that it was actually an issue with an open source library that we were working on. Um, and so the customer actually went and patched the open source library um, themselves uh, uh, because uh, I think that the engineer was like, hey, I, I see what's going on here and, and, I, and I think I can fix this. Um, mm -hmm. And so I uh, fixed it uh, and then we were able to incorporate it faster uh, and, and give it back to them. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a nice thing when it happens. Um, we, as, sort of, as people are driving open source, you can't expect that to happen very often, but it's really nice when it does, and, and, and I think just try to embrace that. Right. Uh, the, the way uh, I've talked to a lot of people, the way some people sum it as that, you know, if uh, if you are t consuming in open source, there are two ways you can contribute. One is either through currency or through code. And as you rightly mentioned, that not a lot of companies do have develop developers resources that they can actually invest. So either, you know, they sponsor project or, you know, when they work with a vendor who uh, who, who is kind of, you know, uh, uh, either maintaining or contributing to the upstream. So they are indirectly, you know, kind of through currency supporting that work because you are working with a vendor. That vendor is, as you gave example, that, you know, he patched, the developer patched. So you are giving feedback to that vendor and that vendor is putting all those changes to upstream. So I really don't think that, you know, if you are uh, touching open source in any way, unless and until you are just taking the whole code, forking it, uh, running it in your own fork, then you are creating a lot of technical debt, you know, then you will not even survive, no point in you. Uh, but I think if you're consuming open source, you are going to help open source in one way or the other. There is no escape. You will be working with a vendor who will help. So that's, I think that's a neat thing people don't understand, but uh, it, it happens. Yeah, you no, a very I, good I, example I think, there, I, yeah. I think, I think you're right. And I think the other thing that it's interesting, because one of the things that Apache really focuses on is community over code. Um, mm -hmm. which people yes. who are not familiar with is, is, is probably a little bit strange when they hear it. But it's the idea that um, uh, the success of a project is, um, is driven more by the community that's working on the project and their collaboration and consensus and driving towards sort of good solutions than it mm -hmm. is about one piece of code. Um, and so we actually talk about, and in many cases, there are PMC and or committers to projects that don't write code. Right. They right. may provide documentation, packaging. They may um, just help out a lot in testing. Um, and so um, I think it's very important to appreciate all of those things. And that's actually something to go out to people who are using um, open source as well, is, is that even if you can't sit down and be a developer that's going to write the next feature or fix this bug, um, that doesn't mean you can't add value to open source and help those communities out. And in many cases, um, uh, those things are actually sorely missed in those communities, is, is that um, you've got developers that are happy to write code but are less comfortable writing documentation. Or, um, right. And so if someone else could come in and say, hey, here's a couple of quick starts or a tutorial, um, that can help out a project a lot. Right. So if, if there is a company, I mean, you did give example where, you know, if there's a company who's using uh, open source and working with, you know, a vendor or something like that, who, uh, and the company itself, they don't have developed, they're a small startup, you know, a small company, they don't have enough developer, they can just, or I mean, when they don't have developer, they cannot even become part of the community uh, to go in there. And, so how can they uh, realistically contribute even even a, a bit? What are the what are the options, you know, since you have been in the community for so long, what are the what are the kind of, you know, opportunities, opportunities for them to participate without creating it as you know that oh why should we even bother with that we can just pay somebody and be done with it but how can they get involved well I think, I think going back to the, what I was saying is is that it's it doesn't have to be a developer that's writing code uh -huh. right um, uh, if you have a person who's using your product like use cases is a good example so one of the challenges exactly. that open source people have is is that they want to figure out ways to test their product. And so right. they can come up with all sorts of unit tests and synthetic data. And I work in data a lot, right? So you're always coming up with synthetic data sets or examples of potential problems. Um, customers can sometimes, depending on where they are, share their use case um, and share details yes. of their yes. use case. Um, and that can help people. So that can help the customer because it means that the open source project can incorporate that set of use cases into the test suites that are run every time someone does a release. Um, but it also, uh, so that helps out the users, um, but it also helps out the community because the product can be better. The, qual the quality of the project can, can improve. Um, and so that's, that's one example, but there are many examples of, hey, come in and tell us what you're doing. Tell us, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what's good with the product, what's not good. Remember that people are, many people are volunteering on the project. 
one of the key things, right, is, is that Apache, while there are many people who are paid to work on Apache projects, the relationship to the Apache project itself is something that is a person um, to to the to the um, the, um, the chair of organization, right? Um, so it, it's that relationship that actually defines what they can do. And so while they may be being paid by someone because that person is very interested in, in, in adding certain features or functionality to an open source project, the relationship is a personal one. And so um, that, that person at the end of the day is the one who's actually making that commitment. And so um, uh, if you come into a community, um, uh, appreciate those people for what they're doing, uh, where they're giving their time and, and when they're spending their time and what they're caring about because uh, open source development, while it may be in many cases paid, is still something you have to be passionate about. Right. Um, in order to do a good job in the community. And so mm -hmm. uh, coming into the community and saying, hey, these are the things that I've learned. These are the things that don't work well. Um, these are all really good things to do. Uh, say, hey, here's, here's some documentation. I just wrote up a little, you know, I wrote up a short, short thing about how we do our use case and, and, and you know, uh, how we use the product to do that use case. Do a little video. Um, all of those things are very helpful to open source and can be done by anybody that doesn't have to be done by someone who's self. Right, and it, it doesn't cost anything. You are just sharing your. But yeah, that's a very. Uh, I was talking to somebody uh, a few weeks ago at DockerCon, and uh, when I asked, his 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 thing was that the biggest challenge for us is that because they are fully open source project, and they're like, I, I, I mean, we wish that our customers will just you know just tell their story. We don't want anything else. Just come out and tell that you are using our product, how you are using it, what problem you faced, how you solve them. You go ahead, download from our GitHub. We don't care, but at least tell us the story. That will help a lot in Mindshare and you know developers to get feedback. Yeah, that's that's excellent. You know, uh, point. Uh, anything else you would like to touch upon? Uh, like we talked about the product, we talked about company, we talked about your engagement with the Apache Foundation. Anything else that you think that we should have talked about, but we could not or we did not? No, I mean I, I would say invite people to come to those communities, right? So mm -hmm. uh, check out what uh, what we're doing uh, on Arrow. Check out what we're doing in Calcite and Parquet. Um, they're they're all really useful technologies. Come come check out what we're doing on Dremio. Um, uh, download the product, uh, you know, fork it. Give us your feedback. Uh, uh, we always like to hear what people are doing with the things that we're building. Awesome. Uh, I think uh, that sums up this interview <laughs> and uh, thanks once again a lot for your time and hopefully we'll see you again at the next show. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for your time as well. It was good talking to you. And back to our audience, thanks for watching and listening today. Please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel. You can find the subscription links on tfir.io slash tv. See you next time. Have a nice day.